I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe God's got a word for you today. I believe that God has placed a word in my spirit this week that is going to speak to your spirit. I, I believe that today God is going to give you the missing ingredient to the recipe in your life that he's been working on. I believe today that God's going to give you a word that's going to be the kind of word that causes your spirit to move. I believe today's going to be a taste and see that the Lord is good kind of word. I believe that today God's going to ignite your spirit with this word. Anybody ready for this word? Mm, I'm ready. You ready? I had last week off, so I came ready. I'm primed. I'm telling you, the pump's primed. So I want you to take your Bibles out. Just go ahead and grab your Bibles. Just turn around. I'm going to let you be seated in a minute. Don't grab a seat. Grab a Bible. Can you stand with me for another minute? All right. Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to say this about today's word. I, I, we're starting something new. I, I don't know if it's going to be a series or not. That remains to be seen, but if it is, we'll follow where God leads us, all right? But what I do know is that God has placed a word in my spirit. And I want you to shake off anything that is like cluttering your mind. I don't want you to think about what tomorrow holds. I don't want you to think about what happened yesterday. I don't want you to think about the bills that you got to pay and the end of the month is coming and you're running out of money and way before you're running out of month. I want you to be thinking about any of that stuff because what God has given me today is rich. And I believe it's going to meet some of you right where you are for a word that you've been looking for. So John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. That's just discouraging, I'm just saying. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. All right, I'm going to need some audience participation today. I'm going to take you to this passage of Scripture. It's in the narrative of, of, of John, the gospel of John. John in this gospel is basically showing us the divinity of Christ. John's gospel is a cool gospel. If you haven't read it through and through, you need to read it through and through. You need to study it through and through. But John's gospel basically identifies for us, paints this image, articulates for us the divinity of Jesus Christ, that he is God in the flesh. His gospel also shows us that he has this creation power. This gospel shows us that, that he's got this transformation power. The image that he's painting for us shows us some incredible things about Jesus. It shows us the divinity of Christ, but also the humanness of Christ. But before I can read John chapter 2, I, I need to back up into John chapter 1. Because in John chapter 1, there are a few verses beginning in verse 39 that kind of give us context to where we're going in chapter 2. You see, where we're going in chapter 2 is the very first miracle that Jesus performs. It's at the wedding at, at Cana. It's where he turns the water into wine. It's this transformative miracle. It is this illustration, this physical illustration for a spiritual problem. And, and he does something incredible in this narrative. But before he gets into that narrative, he kind of sets it up. I've never noticed this before. God gave me a fresh perspective on this, and I've never really seen this before until this week. And I, I want to show you something. Look at verse 39 of chapter 1. Are, are you there? Say, I'm there. Jesus is now selecting the disciples, and he says in verse 39, Come, he replied, and you will see. So they, everyone say they, they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. And it was about four in the afternoon. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him, and he said, You're Simon. Son of John, you will be called Kephas. You are Simon, but you will be called Kephas or Peter. There is this transformation that is about to take place in Simon's life. He's saying, you are Simon. Simon, how you doing? Good, good to meet you. 
I hear you're an awesome fisherman. That's what Simon does. But, but you're going to be Peter, who's going to be a fisher of men. Right now, you're Simon, and Simon means to, to, to change like the wind. It, it, it means shifting sand. But you're going to be Kephas, which means the rock. There's going to be some changes in you, Simon. There's some ingredients that are not present in your life in this moment, Simon. But I'm going to pour those ingredients into your life. And Simon, you will become Peter or Kephas or Rocky. Right now you're not that person, but you will become that person. It's, it's this, this transformation that Christ is going to do in the disciples. He's identifying the disciples. He's talking about the transformation. But then something happens when we go into chapter 2. So remember that. and Remember that. Keep that in the context of this story. I'm going to come back to that part at the very end, and you'll see how it all ties together. But, but look at chapter 2. Chapter 2. Everybody say chapter 2. Let me read it, and then I'll let you sit down. It says this, on the third day, a wedding took place at, at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. <laughs> Let me tell you something, a wedding is a party. In this culture, you think weddings are parties today. Weddings were like the big party. I mean, it was like the lifetime party. I'm going to get into all of that description in a few minutes. But I mean, it's the party of all parties, and Jesus was at the party. Jesus, we see the humanness, the relational side. He's at the party. Jesus is a party animal. Some of y'all are thinking, well, hold on a second. I, you know, I, I don't go to those places. Jesus went to those places. Let me, let me help you understand something. Jesus was not just at the party. Jesus changed the party. Whoop, can I get a whoop? <laughs> You're going to wake up in a minute. So here is Jesus. We see the humanness of Jesus. We see the divinity of Jesus. But let me show you something else, beginning in verse 3. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, There's no more wine, son. He said, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. I would advise none of you to call your mother woman. Only Jesus can get away with that. No, in all seriousness, that word woman, we have not been able to translate the word in Arabic that Jesus spoke. We have not a word that qualifies or quantifies what Jesus actually said to his mother. He didn't call her mother, but it was not a term of disrespect. It was a term of respect. He said, woman, somebody say woman. Why are you bothering me with this? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, just like every mother does, she spins around and says, you do whatever he tells you to do. She kind of makes this go around. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding about 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they did what? They filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, everyone who brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. Somebody say, the best is yet to come. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Hold on a second. I need you to circle that. And his disciples believed. Just circle that in your Bibles. His disciples believed in him. In other words, they moved from information to knowledge. Let me help you understand something. They moved from having information about Jesus to having a knowledge of who Jesus is is. They move from the information that we store in our brains to the, to the knowledge that we store in our hearts. You see, let me say this, and this is a different message, but in our culture today, culture seems to mix up information with knowledge. 
<laughs> Did you hear me? And I don't, I'm not even talking about all the hot button issues. I could get on those right now, but we're not on those. I'm talking about just in our spiritual journey. There's a lot of people around the world that have information about Jesus, but they don't know who Jesus is. Whoo, somebody say that a preach. So there's this information, there's this knowledge, and now they believe in him because of this transformation from water to wine. They now believe in Christ, that he is the Messiah. But it's verse 6 that's going to give to us our title. Verse 6, let me read this, and I'm going to set this up, and then you're going to be seated. I know you've been standing a long time, but it's all right. Somebody say, it's all right. Somebody high-five me. Just give me a high-five. Say, it's all right. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Nearby stood six stone water jars. Hold on a second. This is the instrument that Jesus is choosing to use in this miracle. The six stone water jars, they would be used for the ceremonial washing. I don't have time to expound upon that, but they would be used in an event like this. And here these servants have gone and they've filled up these water jars and nearby are standing six stone water jars. The unique instruments that God would use. Everyone's attention is now on these six water jars. Everyone's looking at them. Everybody's watching them. Everybody's seeing what, what is Jesus about to do. The interesting, unique instruments that God uses in Scripture. Think about with me for a moment some of the instruments that he uses. He used the jawbone of an ass. Somebody's like, oh, I can't believe he said that up in the church. I'm just it's in the Bible. He used the jawbone of an ass. He used, he used slingshot and some stones. He used some foxes with their tails tied together with torches tied to their tails. He's, he's used some very unique stuff. But as unique as the instruments that God has used in Scripture, more unique are the characters that he turns into his instruments. Remember, Simon is there watching this, and Simon means shifting sand. It means blowing wind, but yet he will become Peter, the rock. So let me give you the title, and then I'm going to let you sit down. You ready for the title? He brings the ingredients. Look at your neighbor and say, he brings the ingredients. High five your neighbor and say, he brings the ingredients. Somebody else say, he brings the ingredients. And NBC. Now let me continue to set this up. Thanks, Sam. Because there's a lot happening here in this moment. There's a lot happening with this narrative that I, I've preached out of this narrative. I, I, I've studied this narrative, but God has given me a fresh perspective on this narrative this week. There's two things that I have never seen in this narrative. As many times as I've worked through it, talked about it, preached on it, read it, I, I've seen it. I, I, I've never noticed this. It's something fresh. It's something new. Here they are in verse 11, and the disciples see this transformation, if you will, from water to wine, and it says they believe. The more that I studied that, I began to think, and I've always had this thought, that the, what Jesus did at the wedding was for the wedding party. What I have never done in the past is connect what's happening in chapter 1 to chapter 2. When I connect what's happening in chapter 1 to chapter 2, I realize that it's not just about what he's doing for the wedding party. It's about what he's doing in the disciples. L let me continue to work on this because in my opinion, I came to this opinion this past week. In my opinion, I believe this miracle is the most miraculous miracle that Jesus ever did outside of the resurrection. I want you to hear me out. I need you to pay really close attention because I don't want anyone else. You may have a different opinion. I got the mic this morning. I believe, though, let me set my case up. I believe that this miracle is the most miraculous miracle that Jesus ever did outside of the resurrection. Huh. You might say, well, that's kind of a relative thought, Pastor Mark, because Jesus did a lot of cool miracles. I mean, a lot of big miracles. I mean, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000. Yes, he did. Incredible miracle. 
Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Yes, he did, an incredible miracle. Jesus told the guy with the withered hand to stretch out his arm, and he healed his hand. Jesus told the dude who was paralyzed to get up and walk home, roll up your mat and go on home. All of that stuff is incredible. Some very, 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 very miraculous miracles. However, for the first time I've ever noticed this, The reason why I believe this is the most miraculous miracle of all is because all of the other miracles Jesus performs in the Gospels, all of the ingredients were present. But in this particular miracle, all of the ingredients are not present. Where are the grapes? If he's turning water into wine, where are the grapes? Think about that with me for a moment. He's not taking wine and multiplying the wine as he did the fish and the loaves. When he fed the 5,000, he multiplied the fish and the loaves. When he called Lazarus out of the grave, the ingredients were there because the ingredients were in Lazarus' body. But in this case, the ingredients are not there. There are no grapes. It's just water. Understand something with me. He's not, you know, filling up these jars with some old wine and then pouring water on top of it to make more wine. No, that's not what's happening here. It is water that turns into wine, and all of the ingredients are not there because the grapes are missing. It would have been easy for someone to make wine if they had the grapes and the water, but no, 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 there were no grapes And John's gospel is telling us this is absolutely incredible. In fact, John's trying to show you the divinity of Christ, and he's trying to show us right here in this moment that that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he has creation power. This is a parallel story to the creation story. In fact, in John's gospel in chapter 1, he starts out talking about Jesus and his creative power. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything he made or everything that was made was made by him. And nothing that has been made was made without him. He's talking about his creative power, Liz. He's talking about how he's this creator, just like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Here he is, he's creating wine out of water without the ingredients that make the wine. He's not multiplying, he's creating. And John's gospel, if you continue to read it, this is why I love John's gospel. If you continue to read his gospel, you'll see that his gospel is about proving to you that he is the great I am. Jesus makes seven statements about I am. John records all of those statements, and he says, I am, I am, I am. He's trying to show you that he is the great I am, not the great I was, not the great I used to be, not the great I will be one day. He's the great I am, and what I believe is the great I am is present today, and he can do miracles in this place. I believe the great I am can heal you of cancer. I believe the great I am can heal you of sickness. I believe the great I am can fill your jar. You may be saying your jar is empty. But I believe the great I am can fill your jar. I also believe the great I am can break some things off of your life. I believe he can break alcoholism off of your life. I believe he can break drug addiction off of your life. I believe he can break depression off of your life. But then he also brings some ingredients. He will turn your sorrow into into rejoicing. He will turn your storm, mm, I need you to hear this, into the ingredient of peace. He will turn your weakness into the ingredient of grace. Because he brings the ingredients. So here you have this scenario playing out. You have Jesus at a party showing the relational qualities of Jesus. Jesus throughout the Gospels has other social events that he's at. But this particular social event, there's there's something that happens. He's not just invited to the party, which I absolutely love. It just shows us how relatable Christ is. I think sometimes we become unrelatable when we get Jesus. Hang with me for a minute. I think sometimes we think Jesus makes us better than others. I think sometimes we think Jesus causes us to want to look down upon others, but Jesus was at a party. But Jesus was not just at the party. Jesus' presence changed the party. But I need you to understand something about this party. I mean, it's an incredible event in the life of a couple. It's, it's more than what our culture really 
does today a lot more than what our culture does today. The, the wedding party would identify the personality, the characteristics, the life of this couple for the rest of their lives. What they are identified as, how the party rolls out, would be their identity for the rest of their lives. It was significant. It was the wedding party. It's the party of all parties. It's the thing that sets in action, in the course of action, the couple's marriage, the rest of their lives. What happens here is important. But yet, there's this huge social faux pas. They ran out of wine. The master of the banquet if, if, if he didn't offer enough hospitality to those who are, who are participants, to those guests, it would fall upon the couple and it would be a disgrace for them for the rest of their lives. So much happening here. Rabbis would teach that wine was the symbol, if you will, uh, of joy. And in this moment, they've run out of wine. And therefore, this couple would be identified as not having any joy in their marriage. Here's this wine that they've run out of. And in that day and age, when people would come to the, to the wedding, the master of the banquet would stand at the door and when people came in, they would bring their gifts. And, and so here coming in, the Wiggins bring a toaster. And so the master of the banquet writes down, the Wiggins brought a toaster. Everybody get a toaster at your wedding? You know what I'm saying? You got a toaster. Oh, a coffee maker brought to us by the Johnsons. Woo, yeah. After the wedding was over, the master of the banquet and the family would get together and they would look over all of the gifts. And if the gifts were deemed to be inadequate by your family, then you would be sued. That's pretty harsh for some of y'all cheap people, ain't it? <laughs> I'm talking about I'm going to slide up in that wedding. Nobody going to know. I ain't, got a, I ain't got a gift. So to run out of wine would be a legal problem would be a disgrace for this family. I'm not even talking about the theological significance. Don't anyone leave here and say, well, you know, Jesus created some wine. It's not like today's wine. It was not fermented. No, that's not true. None of that's true. I'm not going to go into the theological significance of that. I, I'm not at all. You can read from the text and you can see how the master of the banquet said this rolled out. Most people bring, you know, the good stuff up front because it, everybody's, you know, past a certain point. They don't know that the bad stuff is last. I, my buddy always says, real talk, that real talk. Listen, I, I don't want to get into that theological discussion with you, but I'm just trying to let you see the whole picture. And so here they have this situation where they're out of wine, and Mary comes to Jesus. She said, Jesus, you, you got to do something, man. Mary knows. She's been sitting on this information. She knows Jesus is divine. She knows. She remembers when, you know, she was 16 years old, and the angel came and, boo, scared her and said, you're going to have a son. His name's going to be Jesus, and he's going to be the Savior of the world. She's known about this divinity, so she's coming up to Jesus. She's like, Jesus, there ain't no wine. The family here, the Joneses, they're going to be disgraced in the community. No, everybody's going to be talking about this event for the rest of their lives. And he's like, woman, what do you want me to do about this? So just like moms do, she turns around, and she says, hey, you. She looks at the servants. I want you to do everything he says to do. Everything he says, you do it. Somebody say, do it. So what does Jesus say? Look at verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Hmm. Verse 7, look what he says. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. What did he say to the servants? Fill the jars with water. So they did what? So they did what? They filled them to what? Huh. He tells the servants to fill these jars with water. Now, keep in mind, there's six of them, roughly 180 gallons worth of water. They're bringing the water back and it's spilling out the top. You know, it's pouring out the side. And everybody's seeing this stuff. Everybody's got their attention on this, this thing. 
Jesus says, fill it up. And when they fill it up, they fill it to the brim. They fill it to the they fill it to the top. They fill it to where nothing else can, can go into this, this, this jar. Why does he do this? One, first off, he wants their cooperation in the miracle. We need to cooperate in the divine works of God. Hello? He works through people. We are his people. We're supposed to cooperate with him in the divine works. But they fill it up to the brim. Nothing else could be placed inside of these jars. They're, they're at the very, very, very top. It's not like Jesus could be like. And pour some stuff in it that's going to change it to wine. Nothing else could be added to it. It's, 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 it's to the top. It's, it, it's spilling over. It, it's, it's full. There's, it, it's, it's, here's what I love about this miracle. The amount of the miracle was directly proportionate to the amount of serving that they were willing to do. Did you grab that? The amount of the miracle was directly proportionate to how much faith they had when they were getting water. Had they only filled up halfway, there would have been half as much of a miracle that happened in that place that day. Somebody say, I'm with you. So with that in mind, I'm thinking about this. You know, I, I, what kind of person would I have been? Would I have been like, man, that, you know, a gallon of water is eight pounds, 30 pounds. I mean, that's a lot of weight, man. I'm going to just fill it halfway up. The miraculous in our lives sometimes is tamped down because of our unwillingness to be engaged and involved in the process. Hold on, l let me say it this way. It, they were filled to the brim. Sometimes I wonder if we're so full of other stuff that it doesn't leave room for God to work. Let me say it this way. I had two thoughts. Like, how do I preach this passage of Scripture from this place? Like, I got two thoughts. Everybody say two thoughts. I didn't know which way to go with this. So I'm going with both. Everybody say, oh, Lord. Oh, thank you, James. Sometimes I think we're so full. Here's the first thought. Sometimes I think we're so full. We're so full of other stuff that we don't leave room for God to work. And then sometimes I think we're so full of God, but we're unwilling to work. I, I need somebody to say, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Somebody say, I know what you mean. Somebody say, he brings the ingredients. So I, I wonder if sometimes, if we're so full of God that we're unwilling to work, who is going to help meet the needs of the people that are around us? If we're so full of other stuff that we don't even notice the needs that are around us, who's going to meet the needs that are around us? What I'm trying to say is God has planted you in a location, and the location that he's planted you in has other people who are connected to you, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit into your life will cause others to benefit from what God is pouring into you. But yet, if you're so full of stuff or you're unwilling to do what it is that God has called you to do, what are they going to do in their lives? How are they going to be impacted in their lives? Let me just tell you something. I could walk you through how, uh, how, how Billy Graham came to know Jesus Christ had someone not invited someone, he would have never even found Jesus Christ. Huh. So there's a lot happening here in this narrative. He says, you, you go and bring me back these, these jars and make sure that they're, they're, they're completely full. You see, Charles Spurgeon, probably one of the greatest preachers who ever lived 150 plus, 60 plus years ago, he, 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 said, he said this about this narrative. He said, he said, this passage of Scripture should paint an image of how our faith works. If we are followers of Christ, then we should be filled with Jesus to the brim. If Christ beckons us to serve, then we should serve him to the brim. You see, this is a physical illustration for a spiritual problem, and the jars are full. They're full in this moment. When they fill these jars up, it's just water. That's all it is, is water. Some of you are full. Right now, some of you are so full. You're so full of the things that God has placed within you, but yet there's been no transformation in your life. 
I need you to hear this because I'm speaking prophetically, right? To, I'm reading somebody's mail. You're so full of what God has placed within you. You're so full, but yet there's no transformation in your life. Can I tell you why? Because you need to reclaim your fate imagination. Did you hear me? Somebody say, yes, 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 I heard you. You need to reclaim your fate imagination. You see, God gives to you fate as an instrument, but he gives to you your imagination as the instrument that works with your fate. It's the tool that works with your faith. Your faith, your, your, your imagination fills up your faith, your imagination. That's the reason why it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think, ask, or imagine. You see, it's your imagination that fills up and fuels your faith. But some of you have taken your imagination, and instead of using it to fill up your faith, you've used it to fuel your fear. And you're imagining every single thing that could go wrong and all the what ifs and all of the difficulties. And you're imagining, you're using the very tool that God gave you to fuel your faith, to fuel your fear. And so you've worked yourself into a place called worry. But once you realize that your imagination is for your faith, you can take that worry and you can turn it into prayer. And you could say, God, you know what? I need you to fill me up with all of the ingredients that I need. I need the Holy Spirit to work inside of me so that I can become what it is that you've called me to be. And the jars are there. And they're full. And I wonder sometimes if the extent of our relationship with God is It's us filling our jars full of stuff, but yet still hoping that God will do what only he can. And the stuff that we're filling our jars with has nothing to do with the things that he told us to fill our jars with. He didn't tell them to go fill it up with Gatorade. And I know Gatorade didn't exist. He didn't tell, he, listen, I, he gave them a specific task. Sometimes we're filling ourselves up with stuff and we're wondering why God's not working in the stuff that we're filling ourselves up with. Sometimes we're, we're filling ourselves up with, let me write some stuff down. Can I do that? Sometimes we're filling ourselves up with our personal preference. I don't know if you'll be able to read this. Sometimes we're filling ourselves up with our personal preference. I want to be careful not to get ink on this pink coat. That's what we're filling our jar with. Sometimes we're filling our jar with, instead of the, instead of the personal preference that we're, filling our jars with, what about the person of Christ? I just had this thought. We fill our lives, our jars up with our personal preference. Our, rather than the person of Christ, it's our personal preference in, in, in politics. It's our personal preference in how we should treat others. And it's our personal preference in what others should be acting and how others should be acting. It's our personal preference. It's, and, and so our personal preference becomes more important to us than the person of Jesus. I, I need an amen here. Sometimes we fill ourselves up with, with, with feelings. Rather than faith. Sometimes we fill ourselves up with convenience. In our relationship with Christ. Rather than commitment. Somebody say real talk. We fill our jars up with that. Sometimes we fill our jars up with, with jealousy rather than joy. And our jars are continuing to fill up and we're going through life and sometimes we fill up our jars with anger rather than forgiveness. 
Is there anybody in this place that would be transparent enough right now in this moment to say, you know what, I got somebody I need to forgive. Just, just raise your hand right, right, right now. We all do. Everybody's got somebody. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody say, I know. We're filling up our jars with this. We're filling up our jars with lust. Porn. Oh, no, he didn't. Filling up our jars with bad attitudes. Oh. Filling up our, 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 our jars with sin instead of repentance. And our jars are becoming so full of stuff. To the brim. And we're wondering why there's no transformation in our lives. We're wondering why it seems like we hear about a word, but we never receive the word. Is there any room? And so our minds go to this place. And can I be perfectly honest with you this morning? I, I, I think when our minds go to this place, we begin to beat ourselves up. And when we begin to beat ourselves up, let me tell you something. If other people talk to you the way you talk to yourself, you throat punch them. You know what I'm saying. Sometimes we just beat ourselves up. But I'm here to tell you today, I want to preach a prophetic word into your life in this moment. You are not here by coincidence. God brought you to this place today in order to fill you up with the ingredients that he wants to pour into your life because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, the best is yet to come. And so... Here's Jesus giving us a physical illustration for a spiritual issue. The, the jars are full. So what happens with the jars being full? Here, here's where it gets good. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, so he looks at the jars. He said, he told them, he said, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. Hold on a second. Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Hold on a second. When did the miracle take place? Fill, draw. Fill up these jars with water. Draw some out. Fill, draw. Fill, draw. Fill, draw. The miracle took place in the pouring out of the water. Did you grab that? It was water in the jars. But when it was poured out, it became wine. When they drew it out, it became wine. Hold on a second. It was water, but then it transformed into wine. It was water that transformed into wine. Some of you are not being transformed in your life because you're filling yourself up with stuff that's keeping you from being transformed in your life. Some of you, are your relationships are not being transformed because you're, you're filling up your relationships with a bunch of junk and anger and resentment and bitterness and stuff that's keeping your relationship from being transformed. I need you to understand something. You, you've got to realize that you've got to open up your heart to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want you to fill me up to the brim with the things of God so that I can be everything that he's called me to be. You see, some of you don't have peace in your life because you haven't been filling yourself with the ingredients of God. Some of you don't have the strength and the power that God wants you to have because you're filling yourself up with other stuff. There's no room for him to add the ingredient. In fact, there, there are people who are like, you know what, I just want a blessing from the Lord. I, I want God to move me into the next season. The problem is you haven't dedicated yourself in this season. I, I want God to promote me. The problem is your attitude is unpromotable. Here's my question. What are you pouring out? What are you pouring out? What are you pouring out? 
on the people that are around you. What are you pouring out? Verse 10. Let me keep going. I, I, I got I to finish. Verse 10. Somebody say he's got to finish. <laughs> Everyone, this is the master of the banquet. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you save the best till now. I, I want you to live by that statement, the best until now. Again, I want to speak prophetically to you. Some of you are close. And you're close. You're close. You're close to that victory. You're close. You're close to that breakthrough. You're close. You're close to that answer. You're close. You're close to that open door. You're close. You're close to that, to, to, to that thing, that, 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 that thing that you've been hoping God would do. You're close. You're close. You're close. You're close. And the very evidence that you're close is the struggle that is happening in your life is the evidence that the enemy knows you are close and he's trying to keep you out of what it is that God's trying to fill you up with. But I need to tell you something. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Verse 11. Verse 11, it says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Hold on a second. They believed in him. So, there's a lot of transformation happening here. There's some water in the wine, but there's some transformation to where the disciples now believe he is the Christ. It's, hold on, there's water into wine, there's that transformation. I, I thought, man, this wedding miracle has been about what Jesus can do for, for people, the, the wedding, the wedding party. But what I realize is it's more about what he's doing in the disciples. I thought this was about a lack of wine, but what I've learned that this is about is a lack of faith. I thought this was about what Jesus could do with water, but I, I now realize this is about what Jesus can do in our hearts. I, I, I thought this was a, about, a, a, about this married couple just being ushered off into the future with bright hopes, but what I've determined is that this is about the disciples becoming who they're supposed to be, being transformed in Jesus Christ. Why? This is the most miraculous miracle, not just because of what Jesus did, but when Jesus did it. Remember back in chapter one, he's calling the disciples to follow him. And he says to Simon, he says, Simon, man, you're, you're awesome. But you're going to be great. Simon, you're shifting sand. You're like the blowing wind. But you're going to be Cephas. You're going to be the rock. He's telling him that I'm going to transform your life and there are some ingredients that are not present in the moment that I'm going to pour into your life and then he walks him into Canaan and he shows him how he transforms the water into wine without grapes. He doesn't multiply the wine like he multiplies the fish and the loaves. He actually creates wine out of nothingness other than water. You see, he's got the creation power to call things that are not as though they are. And he looks at Simon and says, Simon, you will no longer be known as shifting sand, but you're going to be known as Peter, the rock. I'm going to build rocky out of you. Do you understand? What you need to realize is that the things that Christ has spoken over your life, all of those ingredients may not be present in the moment, but he brings those ingredients. You may need self-control and it may not be there in the moment, but he'll bring that, 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 that ingredient. You may need grace and in the moment you may not feel like you have it, but he'll bring the ingredient of grace. You may be in a storm and you may feel like you're overwhelmed, but he'll bring the ingredient of peace. You may be in a confusing situation, but he'll bring the, 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 ingredient, the ingredient of wisdom. I need somebody to get up on your feet and help me. I'm about to give out a breath knowing that he is the one who brings the ingredients. Somebody look at your neighbor and high five your neighbor and say, he brings the ingredients. I think so many times we get so wrapped up with not having or feeling like we don't have enough or feeling like this is missing out or feeling like this job is never going to be what it needs to be or feeling like I'm never going to be what I need to be. Let me tell you something. He 
brings the angry.